is uh, Peter Benton. I'm a former senior economist in the uh, Ontario Government Ministry of Finance. And we have uh, two speakers today. Um, uh, Mario Sakaracci and John Miles. And I'd like to, um, in view of the fact there's very little time, very briefly introduce Mario, our, our first speaker. Oh, Mar so Mario is a professor emeritus in the Department of Economics here at the University of Ottawa, Canada, where he taught for 40 years uh, from 1978 to 2018 in the fields of macroeconomics, monetary theory, labor economics, history of economic thought, and economic history. And if that's not enough, he's also uh, made many presentations or, or in uh, political economy, uh, which covers the areas uh, not only of economics, uh, but uh, political science and sociology. Uh, and that, in some quarters, is regarded as a rare lost art. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mario Sacracci. I'm very happy to be here, and I would like to thank uh, uh, the organizers, uh, particularly uh, Roy, of course, who I've known for a long time. In fact, a very long time, going back to, I think, 1980 or something like that, because he, he took up a course, and he taught a course at the time uh, at the university in the history of thought. So uh, there's a long kind of connection, I would say, and I'm very happy to, uh, you know, as I said, to be here in this group especially. One thing he didn't mention, that I taught for about 18 years at the Labour College of Canada <laughs> in economics. And with people like Sid Ingerman, there's a whole kind of group at the time that I used to be connected with. And so there's a long-standing connection with the trade union movement in particular. Now having said all that, uh, I'm going to talk to you about something that uh, a little more academic, but there's a side to it and uh, that I think will you know, really connect uh, directly with issues that uh, working people especially have to grapple with and it's often not seen or understood. <laughs> and that's the reason why I'm doing this. Over the last, well, I've been working on issues pertaining to monetary policy for quite some time. But over the last year and a half, approximately, I, I got involved as soon as I, I, I was, you know, as, as I was retiring, literally, uh, I decided that I would do something different, uh, in addition to what I usually do, <laughs> okay, which I still do in a sense of research, write, I edit the journal, I mean, all kinds of stuff. But at the same time, I got involved with trying to change the mandate of the Bank of Canada. And, uh, you know, this sounds like a little bit ambitious, yeah? Uh, and uh, indeed it is. I mean, I <laughs> certainly wouldn't want to, you know, suggest that it's, gonna, that it's an easy task at all. But during that whole period, since we wrote up, I wrote up a, a, le well, a petition, basically, a declaration, okay? And got assigned by a bunch of us. I, in the, the initial run, I took about 10 days to collect about 60 or so signatures at the time which I thought was enough, and we send it off, uh, to, and I sent it off to the uh, Minister of Finance, Bill Marneau. Now, he never acknowledged this for a while, but then finally I did get a, a, you know, a letter, and, uh, and eventually we actually met with our group, a uh, you know, delegation of us. So I met with Marneau. I also met with, uh, uh, subsequently, last April, uh, she invited me because she's in charge of this whole issue of how to steer and, you know, the discussion over the mandate of the Bank of Canada. Uh, in this case, with uh, Carolyn uh, Wilkins, who is the, what is the deputy governor there, of the, or first deputy governor, whatever they call themselves, at the Bank of Canada. And, uh, and it's been actually an extremely interesting experience, and I'm going to say something about that at the end. <laughs> but the issues that I'm going to be talking about have to do with something that, as I said, normally we do not even connect. And this has to do with globalization, and I, and I say their monetary policy of inflation targeting. Now, I, I have for you three issues that I'm going to cover that pertain actually to stuff that I 
sort of researched over the years, and I just sort of pulled it together, you know, in some way here to give you some logic to this whole thing and how they connect. One, of course, has to do with you know, the whole issue of globalization trade here in particular that I'm going to talk about, eh? and how that ultimately conditions, uh, as I'm going to try to argue here, not so much conditions just the labor market, which it does, and we, many of us here could attest to that literally, okay? but also, more importantly, it conditions macroeconomic policies of governments, you know, of the state. Okay? In other words, they get into a mindset okay, that is going to affect the way they will conduct macroeconomic policies. And by macroeconomic policies here, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to talk, we're gonna, well, it's essentially fiscal, but I'm going to spend mostly monetary policy. Okay? Second thing I'm going to do, of course, has to do with the nature of monetary policy. Often, when we're presented that, it sounds like almost a technical thing that nobody really understands. It's a lot of smoke and, I mean, whatever you want to call it that is thrown at us. Okay? But there's never really a sense of how it connects with our reality. Okay? Uh, and what I'm going to try to show you, how critical monetary policy is in conditioning income distribution. A lot of what all these debates over income distribution of, are all about have in part to do with the way we have conducted monetary policies over the last 40 or almost, well, since the 1970s, literally. And then at the end, I'm going to just say a, a little bit about what I've been pushing or peddling there, whatever you want to call it there, uh, in this case, in order to uh, have some influence and some change because there are winds of change, okay, that it also are affecting, and in this case, uh, you know, the whole question or affecting all the debate over monetary policy. So let me uh, begin with globalization. Now, some of you may will need probably a, a, a tele well, <laughs> I don't know if you'll need a telescope, but uh, at least for me there. Uh, yeah, I... Uh, I'm going to say something, actually, I, I wanted to put that to remind myself. I don't know if Mel Watkins is around here uh, today. I thought he might be coming, uh, but he may not be here. But Mel, together with Paul Phillips, well, the late Paul Phillips, he passed away some years ago from the University of Manitoba. In 1987, we wrote up a statement. Uh, uh, and, and, well, in this case, against the free trade agreement at the time, mm -hmm. uh, the FTA. And we raised a number of issues. Now, none of us were in principle against freer trade. <laughs> but we are actually attacking it, first and foremost, because we're saying it's not even a trade deal, really. Okay? It was something else. Okay? Uh, you know, it was an investment pack. It was an oil pack. There's all kinds of aspects to it that we raised. But in, in and itself, of course, we weren't against freer trade as long as certain conditions hold. <laughs> and this is what I want to talk about here briefly to begin with. Now, what are these things? And this has to do with the myths, I will call it, of the free trade view of the world and the facts about it. Now, the myth about it is embedded or sort of it's connected with the so-called principle, some of them call it law, <laughs> of comparative advantage. In actual fact, I would say it's not even a law, it's a truism, meaning it cannot be wrong if you take the assumptions as they make it out to be. How could it, it could refute it? It's impossible. Okay, why? Well, because it simply says the following thing. If we remove barriers to trade and all that, and we specialize in whatever we're relatively best at doing, meaning that we're more productive at doing, if we shift our resources towards those sectors of the economy that are therefore more productive, you know, the traded good sector that will become, okay, then of course, you're gonna get more of everything. <laughs> for the <laughs> Now that's not a, <laughs> That's a, as I said, it's a tautology, basically. If this, then that, you can't deny it. 
Okay? But the premises upon which it is based, one can't. And what are the premises? Well, literally going back to the 19th century with Ricardo and all that, uh, you know, what we find, of course, is that the key assumption here, which is full employment, is, 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 you know, is rather something that we should be concerned about because if they start with that premise, yes, if we redistribute you know, our economy in such a way as we're gonna do whatever we're relatively better at, yeah, sure, it'll be the nirvana here, okay? And also, there's no capital mobility here in the original you know, formulation of it, which is another important thing to kind of remind ourselves about that, okay? Now, what does it predict if we would do this? Well, of course, as I'm saying to you, the answer is simple. One, overall productivity, you know, output per head, and there ultimately, because we're gonna get the benefits of that in terms of consumption per head, okay, will rise as a result of that specialization. Second thing, of course, is that if we do, now, if we do specialize and reorganize our activities, we're gonna get more output, more goodies for everybody. And presumably also at lower prices, okay? But there's gonna be a change, however, in the composition of that output in favor of goods that we're gonna be trading now with the rest of the world or whatever you know, we want. Now, let's look at the stylized facts, I call them, about what actually this entails. Now, I'm gonna skip this one, it's harder to see, but we could see with the graph. I did it perf every five years there, but I'm gonna do this one. I just had it from an article, so I didn't update the data, but it's, you know, it's, it's not hard to see from that alone. How I have on the axis, one is the exports as a percentage of GDP. This is for Canada, actually, I should be careful here. This, what I did with this data, I regrouped the three NAFTA countries at the time, okay? So I regrouped Canada, the US, and Mexico, combined all their production, their GDP measures, okay? Combined also all their exports, pooled them together, and said, well, that whole area, now that whole free trade area, quote unquote, what was happening to it as the share of exports rose? And if you look carefully, well, actually, if you look at the previous, uh, you will see that it's in the it, it, it happens to be around the time when, with the breakdown of Bretton Woods, in the early, starting in the 1970s, and with increasing trade liberalization, what we see is that there's gonna be expanding shares of exports. In other words, exports as a share of our total production in that economy is rising, and it continues to do so. In fact, again, if you, it was uh, half the average from the early 60s, there 61 to 65, it was 6.25, okay? By the time we get to 2006, 2010, they're the average for that five-year period, I it was almost 15 or 14.2. So what we're seeing here is a scattered diagram, the annual data here for that whole period, okay? That I, you know, spread it out there. And what do we see now? We see a lot of outliers there, so to speak of it, because there's a lot of things impacting on that. Business cycle, you know, you name it. However, what we see as pattern is important, which is that as the share of export rose, and the more it rose on average, now not for all the period, there's one period where it's, which is exceptional, but there's only one, <laughs> okay? Otherwise, it always is that pattern, which is that as the share of export rises, GDP growth is actually declining slowing down <laughs> all the time. Now, it could be for all kinds of extraneous reasons, you could say. However, I think it's not completely, it's connected, <laughs> okay? That is to say that as, which goes against the whole idea of free trade here, because also another thing to warn you, I didn't do that, but productivity growth also slows down a lot, okay? during that whole period, which is kind of interesting because needless to say, again, if you think of the theory, what it was telling you, that it should be rising, everything should be rising. 
we should be getting more goodies, you know, so to speak here, you know, or in terms of growth rate terms, it should be accelerating, not decelerating, as a result of this growing share of exports. Other things also are important. This one I'd like to show here, which uh, I've shown that for all kinds of the, uh, because if you look at, take Canada, I have that now, what is this? This is for Canada and the United States only, I had that data, I couldn't get it from Mexico. But if you look at Canada and uh, see what, uh, what are those now, the blue line is uh, average labor productivity. I have as the base year 1950, way back. And what we see there is productivity was rising a, a great deal. Then it kind of, as you can see, there's a kind of point of inflection there, so to speak, in the line, where it's, it's still continuing to rise, of course, th that blue line. But it's rising at a decreasing rate, so to speak. It's kind of slowing down relatively, if you look at the levels here. And you can see it in growth rate terms, too. I mean, no, no, that's obvious. But what is even more dramatic is when you look at real wages here, <laughs> or, or an indicator of, in this case, real average hourly earning, real meaning after adjusting for inflation. And what the heck do we see there? We see it that starting in the late 70s, it's becoming flat, essentially, <laughs> if you could look at it. If anything, it even declined at some point, but it's certainly, uh, it's been flat following a kind of stationary path there, so to speak. The United States is the same thing. I have that for the US as well, okay? And it coincides, among other things, with this era of growing trade liberalization. Now, again, is it cause and effect? Well, of course, uh, I, I, first thing that I argue, and I think I'm going to skip some of this because it's not so important, it's a theoretical issue, is that what really governs trade is not comparative advantage. It's what Adam, old Adam Smith in the 18th century argued, which is absolute advantage, really, mm -hmm. that fundamentally in an economy that is not at full employment, then, and this happened even here in Canada interregionally, if you look at it, even in the 19th century with you know, Confederation and all that, we see the same kind of phenomena across, you know, across provinces and internationally the same thing, which is when you open up completely trade with other regions which have half your salary or something or whatever it is, okay, what's going to happen, of course, is that business is going to move to where it's least expensive and, and, and you know, as long as you could offset the transport costs and all that, right? So this is a no-brainer. And what is more important about this is that in an economy, therefore, where you haven't assumed full employment in the first place, it means that that region or that country could be left being having mostly unemployed people, <laughs> okay? Like Trump likes to talk about sometimes. You know, I'm just saying this kind of issue fits neatly here, this whole concern, and it has to do with problems of what well, we, in, in theoretical kind of economic, you know, absolute advantage, and the implications when you have an economy where there's a chronic deficiency of demand as the norm. In a world where unemployment is, you know, you got mass unemployment, and if you're gonna trade with nations like Mexico, for instance, where half of the, you know, where half of the labor force is in the informal economy, well, you're gonna obviously end up with these kind of scenarios. Yeah? Or you could. Now, okay, well, I've, I sort of summarized this here. Now, what's interesting as well, that's the other thing it's, a, it's important to take note of, is that unemployment rates also start to rise around that time. <laughs> yeah? Around that same period, when we're seeing growing trade liberalization, not only do we see flattening of these growth rates and all that, in other words, exports is rising more than overall production. This is, by the way, this is true not only for Canada, US, Mexico kind of thing, by the way. Studies then show it for the, literally for the world economy. It's been growing, yes, but growing at a decreasing rate, contrary to opinion here, okay? even though exports have been rising a great deal. 
And unemployment, as we could see there, again, starts to rise a great deal during that whole era. Okay? Another way of showing this also, I'm sorry that it's very dated, this is 2011, but it's gonna give you a good idea here about the stylized flax again. As I said, I didn't bother to do the calculator, but you could easily do that for later. The, for, the reason why it's a problem of demand here, not because some unemployment was rising because just too many people entering the labor force or whatever might be here, eh, that we can adapt, you know, adjust the, you know, the labor market for that, I have there, let's look at the can. These are just summary. I, I, the cutoff is 1973 with the, you know, with the end of Bretton Woods kind of system. What do we see there? Well, what we see, of course, labor force growth you, was on average from right after the Second World War all the way to 73, 2.4%. So think of it, labor supply was rising here at that rate. And the, in 74 to 2011 at the time, was 1.8, okay, growth on average. So as we can see, there was a significant decline here. Not, so, it can be labor supply here. In other words, there's growing more quickly. Then we need to absorb them. Productivity growth, now that's an important one to take note of. Productivity growth is the, rate at which industry, in a sense, if you had a given demand for products, given output, therefore, that you're going to produce, industry would, in a sense, be shedding, on average, labor at that rate, right? So look at it in the early period there. The growth rate was 4% productivity growth, on average. The rates that we could only dream of nowadays. However, Look at productivity growth after 73, 1.4%. <laughs> yeah? Now, what is that telling us? If demand had been, already, but if demand would have been growing at that rate, okay? excuse me, if demand would have uh, been such that we, uh, uh, we would have, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 let's say in this case, if, if, if demand would have been growing the way it had been growing during the early post-war period, we would have been able to, we would be facing labor scarcity after 73. It, but instead we see growing unemployment. Now what is the reason for that? Well, if I got five minutes, I'm gonna have to really move ahead here. Uh, and what we see here, and, and my argument here, the connection, there is a direct connection because obviously trade liberalization means that certain sectors of the economy are going to be hammered, they're affected, and especially the unskilled workers are the ones who paid a great deal of this because you're competing with others out there. But there's also been another one, which I think is critically important. I would argue it's more important than the one about just direct competition among workers kind of thing. And this has to do well. I, I will skip tax policy or fiscal policy here, although it's obvious that subsequent to, you know, as I said, once we start engaging in uh, liberal, uh, trade liberalization, we uh, try to align ourselves, you know, things of all kinds of stuff, you know, programs, uh, EI, you know, it was UI became EI for obvious reasons we could talk about on the fiscal side, but the one that I want to spend a little time right now is the monetary policy, okay? And the one that, as I said, is the, le is the most innocuous one, so to speak, <laughs> that we never consider, but also the one that I also the left, at least, I don't think understands very well. And uh, now, uh, I'm gonna jump a little bit, uh, except for the fact, I'll just very quickly, uh, I'll skip a lot of that which has to do with, you know, in the early post-war period, there was a commitment on the part of the state, you know, sort of Keynesian type policies. I won't say they were fully committed to full employment in this country. No, but certainly much more so than what happened subsequently. And why is that is the issue? Well, because we became more and more obsessed about the need in, to be competitive. When you're opening up trade, you gotta worry about your competitiveness position. So it's gonna affect your fiscal policy, your tax policy, it's gonna affect your, your expenditure side, but it's also gonna affect the way you conduct monetary policy. And guess what? 
It is in the 1970s again that it starts. And by 1991, look at the year, 1991, when we officially in, adopted inflation targeting, okay, that this coincides <laughs> after the, the uh, FTA and all that. And what we have here now is a commitment to do what? Uh, well, basically, what we see here, and I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to jump a lot of this, uh, which is that the way in which we start conducting monetary policy was that, first and foremost, we abandon altogether all other possible goals and replaced it unofficially, by the way. Not officially, because if you look at the preamble in the case of Canada, with the preamble to the Bank of Canada Act, we have a lot of stuff in there in terms of goals than just inflation that they should be concerned about, including employment, growth, et cetera, et cetera. Yet, as we you know, starting in 1991, but it began much earlier, by the way, it started literally in the 70s. We became obsessed with one goal here, single goal, which is to combat inflation, to be concerned about inflation. And we did it in a more rigorous way, quote unquote, okay? By the time we got to the, uh, when we, uh, as I said, after the FDA, in 1991, we officially adopted inflation targeting, right after New Zealand, in 1990. And what was the idea, now how do you do this? Well, in fact, I argue, and I've argued that in a number of papers on this issue, that inflation targeting is a specific type of incomes policy, primarily. It's an incomes policy that pits one group against another. In, now, traditionally, incomes policies, those of you who are old enough to perhaps remember this, but if you go back to the 1960s and 70s, even here in Canada, but in the US, they had, they had, we played around with incomes policies. The last one, when I was actually a consultant economist for the railway unions in the mid-70s, in 76, 77, I remember, we had to deal with the AIB, the Anti-Inflation Board. I don't know how many of you will remember that, since there are a lot of us uh, <laughs> that, you know, that are old enough to perhaps remember that. And, but that was a compulsory incomes policy. But we used to have, uh, with the Prices and Incomes Commission, in the US under the Kennedy-Johnson administration, they had the guideposts, they called them at the time, where they would announce a certain guidepost, right, a guideline here, or norm, for wage growth. But they wouldn't just throw some number in the air. They had to defend it on the basis of primarily Distrib income distributional neutrality. In other words, that if we're going to set a norm, that that norm for wage growth should be such that it should be adjusted. In other words, it should cover inflation. So real wages should be protected. You know, in other words, they should be. But also get a share of the national pie in terms of productivity growth. Okay? Some of you that went through the EIB might remember they used to have a, a national productivity factor of 2% at the time. Anyways, just to tell you here that they had to defend it so that real wages could, should at least grow with productivity in order to be able to maintain labor share of the national pie. And guess what now? What did we do this time? We decided to do something rather different. By the way, I studied how they did it in New Zealand because New Zealand was the first country that adapt, adopted inflation targeting in 1990. And New Zealand wanted to adopt an incomes policy in the public sector and discovered that there might be a better way to get away with this. Okay? In this case, at the time, by an, uh, having an inflation target set by the central bank. Now imagine all of a sudden it's a central bank, something nobody can test. As you know, if you look at the ranking, you know, who's believable, you know, 
and who you should trust the most, central bankers still remain extremely high. <laughs> and therefore, if you get this kind of thing coming that we should reach a 2% goal, and that becomes the norm, that all sounds very good, right? Well, guess what? There's something wrong with that. If you announce, let's say, as we have right now, because we, all of you, I'm sure, would know that we've been following more or less, if, if you're in the trade union there, you would know right away, which is that wages, nominal wages, are growing more or less with the inflation rate. As we saw, actually, with, the, with my line there, as you can see, it's pretty flat. So in other words, real wages are stable, more or less, but they're not growing. <laughs> so going back to our earlier graph where we had this bifurcation between productivity and real wages, what's been going on there? Well, what's been going on, of course, is that you have, of course, no mechanism here to guarantee that wages will even keep up with inflation. Could you imagine the Bank of Canada announcing, well, we would like, we want to target 2%, but wages should grow at least 4% or something. <laughs> That's not what's happening. And therefore, if you have a steady kind of state world where you have wages and prices moving in more or less in tandem, well, it sounds like the nirvana for some people. And in fact, uh, Carolyn Wilkins asked, or even Bill Marno, what, what's the problem? Why do you want to fix something that is uh, broken, so to speak? Well, it is broken because it's completely biased against labor. And you could see it, and I'll just jump. Uh, here's a share of uh, wages. And if you kind of look at the, the second peak there in 1991, literally, and look at what's been happening to the share of labor at our national income in Canada. It's been declining during that whole period. On the other hand, other measures, I've used, I, I, this is the so-called Pazinetti Index, which is just a way to explain how rentier income has been evolving. I'm not going to go to the details, but you could see the rentier income, interest income, real interest income, shot up, except in, in, after the financial crisis, as we know, because interest rates went down the tubes here now for, for other reasons. And just one last thing, because I'm not going, I'm going to jump all this here. I just want to say this, and I'll, I'll stop, which has to do with the uh, issue of the mandate at the Bank of Canada. Uh, we've been pushing for a dual mandate. In fact, Senator Zian Belmar and I have been asking where that we We've met with all kinds of people over the last while. But also as a group, we met with the, as I said, both with the minister and so on. And I recall what Carolyn Wilkins said to me, she asked, when I mentioned the whole issue of income distribution, she felt puzzled because she says, well, at the bank, we, f we feel that we are neutral with respect to income distribution issues. And you know why they say that? is because they look at interest. When they raise it, I said, well, that's funny. I said, when every time you raise interest rates, it raises costs, yes, but it also raises the income of some people. So they look at it as a cost, an implication in terms of how it impacts on investment decisions about, you know, borrowing, and et cetera, et cetera, but they don't look at the income side. So I'll, I'll leave it there, and we could take questions afterwards.